Anybody who's sprayed foam in a cold climate knows how tough it can be to maintain the temperatures in the hose coming to the gun and making sure that you're really dialed in on the application. Today's video is gonna give you tips and tricks on how to maintain your spray foam application when it gets really, really cold outside. If you're in a different climate than us, this might not be the video for you, but for anybody north of Southern Illinois, th this should be something that's really helpful. The truth is, Many spray foam companies don't implement the techniques that we use because it costs money. It costs money to be efficient. It costs money to have the best final product. If you're a consumer, this video is gonna help you identify a really good company. They're gonna be putting a lot of these techniques into the field. They're gonna be looking for ways to improve so that they can give you a better final product. If you're an applicator and you're having trouble in a cold climate, a lot of these things should get rid of some of the problems that you're having. We didn't start out our company with all of these products, all of these tools, all of these things that help us on a day-to-day -day basis. We actually built over time, over the last four or four and a half years, a much better system, a better way of applying in cold climates. We're gonna take you through the pricing at the end of the video, so make sure you stay to the end so that you can get an idea what you're looking at in costs. And that's what we're gonna take you through today inside Lighthouse. start inside the trailer. Right behind me is our 200 linear feet of hose and you can see on it there is two different types of hose wraps. When we first started we didn't have any type of hose wrap. We had the typical scuff guard that gets torn right away. Two years ago I purchased a sidewinder hose wrap that was uninsulated and it lasted. It did a, it did a pretty good job. I found that a lot of times when it was sitting in the sun the black color actually made it a little bit too hot. Within the last two months, we went through Liberty Foam to purchase an insulated hose wrap. It's a little bit less expensive. It's the white colored one. It's the one that's gonna sit outside in the sun. So we moved the back 100 feet of Sidewinder that saw very little abuse, very little damage to the front of the gun. And we put the new white insulated hose wrap on the 100 feet that comes from the trailer to wherever we're spraying. Yesterday, it felt like three degrees outside and our hose sat outside for almost 20 minutes before I started spraying. When I turned our machine on, it was 68 degrees in the hose, which is amazing. That thing is definitely working. That's a huge advantage. That's something that I wish I had done much earlier and I'm really happy that we did it. On my right, your left, you can see the power blankets that we use. They're barrel heaters. They never go above 80 degrees. They turn off when it hits 80 degrees. The power blankets maintain the temperature in the barrels. We use them overnight a lot of times just to make sure that we have the right temperature. And in the field, they're indispensable. They let you have the door open and, and do what you need to do without being worried about having your barrel temperature go down too low. When it comes to barrel temperature, what you're looking at is the delta T. You're looking at the difference between the temperature in the barrel to where you're trying to get to. So if you have your machine set at 115 degrees, a lot of machines have a delta T of about 45 or 50 degrees. So you wanna make sure you're within that, that zone or you're never gonna be able to get your material up to temperature. These barrel heaters help you do that. They help you maintain the temperature of your barrel. They help you maintain the temperature so that you can apply the best foam possible. Also, underneath the barrel, you can see one by twos that we put underneath. The whole idea is to get that barrel off the ground when you're driving, especially in the morning. You can see that it gives it a little bit of an air gap. So as heat moves around the trailer, it makes it less likely that the bottom of your barrel is gonna get too cold. If you're experiencing problems with your application when it gets below 30 degrees, make sure to check the temperature of the barrel and make sure that your barrel's off the ground. It's gonna make a world of difference and it's pretty cheap. What we found to be the most difficult piece of spraying in cold weather is the travel from the shop to the job site. Sometimes we have an hour drive between the shop and the job site. And I know a lot of you guys have much longer drives. So the trouble is keeping the temperature of the trailer high enough to maintain the barrels in that time period. If you're driving two or three hours, you're gonna have to have some way to keep this space heated. I don't have the answer for the two to three hour. What I do have the answer for is the hour between where we are in the western suburbs of Chicago and wherever we go in the Chicagoland area. 
Our solution was to make sure that as soon as we got on the job site, we could turn on a heater, a propane heater, without needing to connect to anything. We just had it ready to go. And our solution was having a propane tank in the trailer at all times that is at least halfway full. And we invested in two cordless propane heaters between 30 and 60,000 BTUs. They're from Mr. Heater. They're a pretty cool product. Uh, they let us connect right away without having to run a power cord to the house. A lot of times we're running shore power, so we don't have the luxury of just turning on our generator and getting going. It's been the best way that we've found to handle the crucial minutes between when we get on a job site and when we can turn on the heat. The fact that the propane heater is cordless is a huge advantage. I suggest that you look into grabbing one of them, especially if you're spraying in sub-zero temperatures. By far the toughest problem that we had to solve was exhausting the compressor out of the trailer in a way that was safe and effective and and I don't know why I struggled with this so much but this is the third shot at doing this and this one works really well what's really tough about this is the diameter of the exhaust there's very few pipe choices that you have to exhaust out a trailer this is the best thing that I've came up with it doesn't move it gets all the exhaust out of our trailer the carbon monoxide levels are really low and the key was this flexible exhaust pipe, but fitting it into place was the tough part. So I had to actually shave some of the sides. If you want us to go into more detail on this, I, I certainly can. If there's a lot of individuals that have gas compressors that are having trouble exhausting them, we could do a little tutorial on, on how to put together this exhaust pipe, but hopefully just taking a look at it and knowing that it's possible gives you a little motivation to go and try to solve it yourself. One of the other parts that's been really difficult for us is how to make sure that we can keep the doors of the trailer closed while we're on the job site. When I first started this business, I didn't have a lot of money to get started. I had to buy what I thought was a bare bones trailer and build into it. That means that our rig is uninsulated, except for the floor. The underside of the floor is sprayed, and that does make a big difference. But the walls are uninsulated, the ceiling are uninsulated, and we have a gas compressor inside of the trailer. So that presents a couple of problems, a carbon monoxide problem if you run the gas with the door closed. It runs an issue with not getting enough heat into that trailer to be able to maintain the barrel temperature. And the solution for us was to add certain components to our trailer to help us along the way. The first two I wanna show you are the, you can call them doggy doors or doors for the hose and for our shore power connection. And they're pretty simple. This one isn't too great that I did. I made this on my own, it's pretty janky. Um, but it serves a purpose. It opens up. It makes sure that we can close this door. Still let the hose come out of the bottom. A lot of rigs that you buy that are kind of turnkey, ready to go, have this already included. If I could do it again, I would do it a lot better. I would do it a lot different, but this is what we're left with. The other thing that we did early on was adding a separate door for our shore power. So when we get on the job site, we run our shore power to the, to the house, and this is our connection. So we've showed you all the equipment that we use to get on site except for one. The most expensive and the most unnecessary in the grand scheme is the large heater I have behind me. In order to properly heat up a space to have spray foam applied, you need to have indirect heat. An indirect heat could be either a furnace, uh, a, you know, a, home, a homeowner's furnace or a building's furnace, or you can purchase a unit like we've purchased, which is a, an indirect diesel-fired heater. And the reason why is because the typical torpedo heaters, the things that everybody uses, introduces too much moisture into the air. And large quantities of moisture is gonna make the adhesion of the spray foam more difficult, if not impossible and filled with errors. So I went through nine years without my own indirect heater. It's a luxury, but it's something that really saves us a lot of time. It adds a lot of value to what we're offering. Sometimes we can include the cost of the heater into the job. We can offer to rent it to our clients, which is something that we do on a pretty regular basis. They can rent it from a, uh, a rental place for $450 or they can rent it from us for 200 and they can still take care of the fuel. It's something that we just introduced this year into our business and it's working out really well. We've been able to pay down about a third of the cost of the heater 
To give you an idea, this heater fully set up, everything ready to go, including ducting and anything else you need is about $4,000. So it's, a, it's an investment, but it's something that allows you to basically get a job done. So you're on site, you have all the tools you need. The only piece that we haven't talked about is preparing your client for the job. A lot of what we do is expectation management and making sure that the client has the right information. The right information is the temperature you need the substrate to be at. For us, we require a minimum of 50 degrees. 50 degrees on the substrate. And how do we check that? We use a couple different tools that allows us to check it. We use an infrared thermometer, so that we can actually show up on the job site and shoot the roof structure or shoot the walls and show the client if it's less than 50 degrees. We use a wood moisture meter because if you bring the space up to temperature too quick, you can have sweating on the walls, especially when you're using something that isn't an indirect heater. That's really common. We tell our clients to at least 24 hours beforehand have 75 degrees going in the space. So sometimes it takes 48 hours. But we use that equipment to do that. And then finally, relative humidity is important. So we have a device that actually measures relative humidity. You can tell a lot by crunching the numbers. You can tell if your client turned on the heat at six o'clock in the morning. You can tell if the temperature isn't at what you need to be. And in your contract, it should state the minimum that you require. We actually have a mobilization charge that we, that we pass off to the client. Uh, in the event that they don't bring it up the temperature or they don't give us a warning. And it's gotten rid of a lot of the problems that we had over the last three and a half years on my own and then the four years beforehand, five years beforehand, running a different company. So I promised you that we would go over the numbers. So let's do that real quick. So far we've covered hose wrap, insulated hose wrap and non-insulated hose wrap. Each 50 foot section of that is about $250. You can plan on that being about 250. So if you have 200 linear feet, you're looking at about $1,000 of hose wrap. We covered power blankets, which we're not sponsored by power blanket. That's just the one that we use. You can get the one that you want. Each one of those are about $600. So you have $1,200 in power blankets. If you really wanna to go to the ends, uh, you should get two sets of them because usually we have two sets on our rig or three if, you, if you're able to carry three sets. If you're looking at about $1,200 for that, so we're up to 2,200 bucks. We cover the propane heaters. The propane heaters are about $200 each, $210 each. So we, we keep two of them because it's convenient just in case. So let's round that up to 500. We're at about 2750. We showed you our exhaust. That's really a negligible cost. It's just trying to figure it out, maybe 20 bucks in materials and being able to weld. We covered the doggy doors. Again, it's like $20 in cost doing that. Um, the spray foam on the underside of our trailer, you should be able to do that pretty cheap, uh, a couple hundred dollars there. And we covered our indirect diesel heater, which is about 4,000. So altogether, we have about $7,500 in cost in just being able to manage the temperatures so we could apply our spray foam well. It sounds like a lot, but we did that over four years. So if you think about it, that's only about $1,500 a season. $1,500 a season you can come up with and you can do it in pieces and you can make sure that you're applying the foam the best you possibly can. What I really wanna bring your attention to is not how much it costs to purchase the equipment, but how much money you're going to save for the rest of the time that you're running your business. Some of these things are gonna have to be replaced, but realistically, you have a really good chance of losing about 10% of your yield every time you're spraying in the cold. And 10% of the job, depending upon the size, can add up quickly. When I did the math, when I first started really focusing on maintaining our, maintaining our temperatures and maximizing our yield, I figured that in the first year alone, we would save between five dollars and $10,000 in material costs. That's a lot of money. The first year we paid back we were paid back everything that we spent over the four years. Over time, I think it could conservatively be about $100,000 that we're able to save by putting $7,500 into our business. That's a heck of a return, and that's something you should definitely consider when you're thinking about purchasing this equipment. I'm sure there's some things that we forgot along the way in making this video for you. If you have any tips or tricks that we did not include, make sure to put it in the comments below. It's gonna help everybody out. There are no secrets anymore with the internet. So at the very least, just try to help out your fellow applicator in, in, in doing a much better job. These videos are really fun to do because it, it was hard fought experience that allowed us to, to really improve our business. And, and we just want to save you all of that energy, all those struggles, all the times drilling out the gun and wondering where your material went. 
and we really hope it helps. If you like what you saw today, make sure to subscribe and we'll make sure to see you next time inside Lighthouse.